Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce the uh, keynote speak next keynote speaker, Michael Franklin, who is a professor of computer science at UC Berkeley, uh, a well-known researcher in the database area, and a graduate from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where uh, I knew him first. <laughs> so, Mike, All right. thank you. All right, thanks, Jim. Okay, well, um, it's after lunch. We've got a dimly lit room. <laughs> for for yeah, everyone's got everyone's got internet access. Uh, it's actually not. It's it's very much like teaching. So uh, we'll, we'll see what happens. And uh, I know everyone that's typing is taking notes. So uh, okay. So um, well, thanks for having me here. Um, I'm going to tell you about a, a project that we started recently at Berkeley uh, called the AMP Lab, and AMP stands for Algorithms, Machines, and People. And it's basically about big data analytics. And so fortunately, uh, because of some of the earlier talks uh, today, I'm going to be able to go quickly through the motivation and uh, get right into uh, you know, some of the more technical stuff. Um, what I'll do is I'll tell you a, a little bit about how the lab's structured, because it's, um, it, it's kind of an interesting way of, of, of doing uh, kind of large-scale academic uh, computer science. And then um, I'll talk a little bit about each of our key areas, algorithms, machines, and people, um, focusing a little more on the people side of things, and then uh, just wrap up. So you know, here's the motivation. You've actually seen some of these numbers already. But big data is everywhere. Um, you, know, it, um, you know, web companies, uh, you know, Facebook is kind of extreme at 130 terabytes a day. But even you know, web companies you've never heard of uh, are dealing with you know, terabytes of data coming in per day. Um, you know, companies are chewing through that data continuously. So you know, this statistic of Google uh, processing you know, 25 petabytes a day. Um, we've already heard about uh, genome sequencing and um, uh, a lot of the big science use cases. And uh, I think this is the same number that Jim showed earlier um, uh, of just how much data is being created. So big data. Um, and it's, it's only getting bigger. Um, and so uh, why is that? Well, as we've already heard, you know, all these cool devices that are going to be out there that are continuously collecting and generating data. Um, people uh, connected, doing more and more online, uh, working together, social networking we already talked about. And you know, also, as we talked about, the fact that it's get, just getting cheaper and cheaper to store things, and conversely, more and more expensive to figure out what to throw away. And so in general, people are just keeping data as much as they can. Um, now, there's a couple things that haven't really gotten enough attention uh, to my uh, taste so far today. So I'll, I'll spend a little more time on these. But it's not that it's just a lot of data. But the problem is that there's all sorts of issues with dealing with that data. So it's one thing to collect a bunch of data all right, and get those petabyte numbers up there. It's another thing to actually try to make sense of it. And there's a lot of really hard problems and a lot of reasons for why that is. And so you know, the data is coming from all over the place, lots of different sources. The data was created for lots of different reasons, not often the reason that you want to use it for when you're doing your data analytics. Um, there's often no schema, so you have to sort of figure out what the data means. Um, when you're getting data from lots of different sites, it's often inconsistent in terms of the meaning of the data and, and also in terms of the facts that are in the data. And you, know, you have problems with, with not only semantics, but even just the syntax. You know, somebody hands you uh, a bunch of information that they got from 100 different places, you're going to be pretty busy trying to figure out what's in all those different data sources and getting them all to work together. So um, a big thing that, that, I, I, that, that you know, a big set of problems that is going to come up with big data isn't just you know, how do I store it, how do I move it through the network, how do I push it through my processor, but it's how do I make sense of it. Okay? And so you have that problem with the data. You also have that problem uh, on the query side. Okay? And again, wh why is that? Well, as you're collecting these data resources, uh, they're incredibly valuable, or at least uh, the hope is that there's some value in there. And so people want to use that information for lots of different reasons. So queries uh, are diverse. Uh, some are short, some are long. 
Uh, some are very detailed, some are summary oriented. Uh, people are asking lots of different questions. Uh, time sensitive, so if you're looking at data in order to make a decision, you need your answer in the time frame that you have to make that decision. Um, opportunistic, a lot of companies that are collecting information, and, and also you know, in science, um, you've got this data, you want to find interesting things in it. So you're going to poke around and see what you can find that's interesting. Uh, and so it's opportunistic and exploratory. And also there's a slightly more technical problem, which is as you collect more and more data, um, you're just by chance likely to find what you're looking for. Okay, and so this multi-hypothesis pitfall is a name that we're giving to a, a well-known problem in statistics called uh, family-wise error, which basically just says, uh, well, I'll tell you more about it, but basically says as you ask more questions on more data, eventually you're going to find what you're looking for even if it's not true. Okay, um, that's the non-technical version. So, okay, so we're doing this uh, project on big data. So first thing we had to do was define what we meant by big data. And obviously, uh, any number you come up with is, is going to be laughable in just a couple years. So, you know, you don't want to put a stake in the ground and say, well, a petabyte's big, anything less than that isn't. So we tried to come up with a scalable definition, and this is our current working definition. And uh, basically, it's summarized in this little graphic here, which is um, if, if you've got a data problem that just by doing the obvious things uh, doesn't allow you to get the answers that you need sort of in the time that you need them, with the cost that you can afford, uh, and with the quality that you need in order to, to for the, whatever use you want of that answer, then you've got a big data problem. Okay, so some, you know, if you're a big web company, maybe it is a petabyte when you start, you know, having your problems with big data. Um, but if, if you're a single person just trying to do some data analysis with R or something like that, you know, if you get a gigabyte of data, you're going to be pretty busy with that. And so the, the important thing here is it's really this, this, this three-way, um, you know, these sort of three conflicting goals of, of time, cost, and answer quality. Okay, and um, you know, some people will say you can sort of only get, you know, you can pick any two of these. We're going to try to do better than that, but uh, that's, that's what you have. So, okay, so that's our definition of big data. Now, what's our angle on big data? So everyone uh, who's talked so far today and probably, you know, for the rest of the conference is talking about big data. So what's our particular angle on it? And our angle is, is really uh, represented in the name of our project. So uh, basically what we're saying is that if you think about doing analytics on big data, you've sort of got three basic classes of, 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 of tools you can use. Uh, the first is algorithms. So you know, think about machine learning, uh, business intelligence types of things. Um, and what we need there is to you know, improve the scale, make them more efficient, and you know, really get at this quality issue. Okay, so that's the algorithm side of what we're doing. On the machine side, no surprise, since I was asked to come speak here, it's about cloud computing, uh, you know, warehouse scale computing, and, and how, do you, how do you leverage increasingly uh, you know, cheaper and increasingly massive uh, computational and storage power. And then um, the, the third aspect, which, which I think um, is, is a little bit, uh, well, I guess I'll just, it, it's one of the things that sort of separates us from a lot of the other work that's being done in the area is the people side. And the idea here is that we want to be able to leverage uh, human activity and intelligence throughout the whole data analytics process. So people create the data in a lot of cases because they're the ones carrying the devices, they're the ones uh, writing the restaurant reviews and so on. Uh, people are ultimately using the results of the analytics because they're the ones that are asking the questions in, in most cases. Uh, and furthermore, through some you know, techniques that, that we'll talk about a little later, people can, people can actually get involved in the analytics process themse themselves or itself. Okay? So our pitch really is, well, I'll show you the pitch, but it's this. It's algorithms, machines, and people. So what do we mean by that? So let me try to make it a little clearer. So if you think about today's solutions along these three axes, um, there's a bunch of stuff um, they're really focused on exploiting more machines, okay? And so uh, uh, Oracle is my stand-in for, for you know, traditional databases. I didn't update my slides for this talk. Uh, Hadoop, we've already heard a lot about. So you know, there's a bunch of people trying to push um, you know, the limit on, on you know, use more, throw more and more machines at the problem to solve the problem. Um, there's a bunch of interesting stuff going on in the people dimension. Uh, 
we, you know, online, uh, you know, Web 2.0 types of systems like Yelp and user-generated content systems, uh, you know, rely on people for to to drive what's going on there. And then uh, we'll talk some more about uh, crowdsourcing types of systems like Amazon Mechanical Turk. They're basically explicitly trying to create marketplaces where you can get people to do work. Okay, so this is stuff that's all in the people dimension. Uh, on the algorithm side, um, you know, there's a lot of tools out there for doing machine learning and for building your machine learning libraries. And you know, our argument is that if you look at existing solutions, they tend to be focused you know, really on one of these dimensions. You know, there are a few things that sort of wander towards the middle. So if you think about web search, um, you know, heavy use of machines, obviously a lot of smart algorithms going on in there. A little bit, uh, you know, some people are involved for curation and stuff like that. Uh, you think about something like IBM Watson, um, fewer machines typically, uh, arguably uh, more sophisticated algorithms. We could debate that if you wanted, but, uh, you know, a lot of work on the algorithms there and, and a little bit of people. Okay, so there are some systems that we're seeing that sort of tending in, in you know, looking at using these three t types of resources. But by and large, what you get is, some, is, a, is a solution that was focused on, you know, I'm going to make a better, uh, you know, algorithm for my machine learning problem. Or I'm going to figure out how to, you know, scale my cluster from 10,000 machines to 20,000 machines, right? You usually go along one of those dimensions. So, you know, the AMP Lab is basically saying that we want to think about these issues uh, are these resources holistically. And so if you take um, those dimensions, you know, this is where we want to be. We want to be able to, um, for a given problem, leverage the right resources in the right amounts, at, you know, in the right time. So, you know, when you can make progress by harnessing more machines, let's be able to do it. When a smarter machine learning algorithm is going to give you a better answer or a more or quicker answer, let's do that. And when people can help, let's get the people involved. Okay, and really the challenge of, of what we're doing is to try to figure out how do you build the, the, the software infrastructure to allow these three resources to be used in a, in, a, in a flexible way like that. So, you know, what's the AMP Lab? Well, it's um, a five-year project that we started uh, officially in February. Obviously, we spent a lot of time uh, doing groundwork on the way uh, up to that. But um, it's a, a five-year research project that we're doing largely at Berkeley. And our goal is to uh, build a new generation of big data analytics tools that leverage those three resources that we talked about. And the whole idea is to be able to answer questions at scale. Um, just to give you a feel for who's involved, or, um, there's a bunch of people um, in the computer science department that are involved. And um, you might know some of these names, but even if you don't know the names, what you'll see is sort of the list of specialties that people have. And what we've done is we brought together um, you know, a core systems group, some machine learning expertise, some database expertise. Uh, Alex Bayan, uh, I'll talk a little bit about his project, but he's been focused on participatory sensing at large scale um, in, with mobile devices. Uh, Anthony Joseph, who's a security and privacy guy, and uh, you know, also networking people. So the, 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 the key foundation of our lab is we take these people, um, believe it or not, I think there's a lot of academics in there. I think most of the people in the room are academics. To play in this lab, here's what you do. You give up your office, you move into a cubicle in a big uh, open space, and in that, in that open space is about 50 people, uh, these faculty and a bunch of students and postdocs. Okay, and you say, okay, I'll do that for five years. And that's... And, and so that's how we've set up the project. And so uh, the idea is to be highly collaborative, work together, lots of uh, design meetings, and lots of opportunity for interaction. The other thing that's interesting about this lab is the way that we funded it. And built on, based on the success of some uh, uh, previous large projects at Berkeley, we actually decided to uh, try to fund this thing f primarily through industry support. And so um, we've gotten great uptake from... Uh, all these companies, Google and SAP, signed up as um, what we call founding sponsors. They've made you know long-term, you know, larger commitment. All these other great companies, including Microsoft, uh, have signed up as sponsors as well. And uh, what we do with these companies is we have uh, regular meetings uh, every six months. We have a research retreat. We just had our last, our spring one last week. Um, all these companies send people. Our students give talks, posters. We show demos. We discuss what we're doing, and we get feedback from all these people. 
And uh, that's how we make sure that the work we're doing stays relevant, that we're not missing any big trends in industry, that we're not solving problems that are already you know, well understood and well solved uh, out in industry. So that's you know, the, how the lab's set up. And um, you know, it's, it's, it's an interesting way to, to, to try to do uh, you know, big systems research in a, in a university. That's what we're doing. So OK, so given that, um, oh, one more thing about the way it's set up. Um, if you're going to do research on big data, you need some big data. So, um, <laughs> so we said, OK, well, let's, let's try to go out and, and, and find people that have big data problems as we've defined them in that previous slide, right? So they can't get the answers they need in the time they need it at the cost that they have, can afford, and with the quality that they need. So we looked around campus, right? Universities are great places to find people who are trying to solve cutting edge problems with data. So we just started looking around campus to see who had problems that, that, that and, you know, and wanted to work with us. And we ended up with four really interesting applications. So the first one is this one that I mentioned. Uh, it's called Mobile Millennium Project. Um, their initial project was on um, how do you infer and, and, and predict traffic patterns and, and uh, future traffic patterns uh, based on continuous re readings you're getting from people's cell phones. OK, so it's a large scale sensing application. They're moving now into other types of participatory sensing, um, you know, air quality, noise, quali uh, you know, noise levels. Um, they're actually doing some things with water movement and things like that. So you know, the idea here is lots of data from the physical world coming in in a continuous way with all the problems that you get when you deal with data from the physical world and from cheap devices. Um, we're um, working with a group in the College of Environmental Design um, that does urban microsimulation. And actually, a lot of Paul Waddell uh, was a guy who was at University of Washington uh, who recently moved to Berkeley. Um, he is, he's an expert. He's built a system called UrbanSim, which basically takes very fine-grained information about, ur about urban environments and then builds simulation models using that information to try to predict the, uh, the, the outcome of certain policy decisions. So you know, if I was going to put a transportation hub in this part of the city, what would that do to traffic, to the economy of uh, different, different parts of the city, to the, to the pollution levels, and so on? And so what's great about this problem is it's uh, being simulation based, um, they can basically generate as much data as we can handle. Okay? It's he heavily dependent on machine learning uh, to do some of the predictions. And uh, it's also got a huge data integration problem because the data that you get from um, all these public records and other sources is often wrong and, and conflicting. And so there's a big data cleaning and integration problem. Um, Ken Goldberg, who uh, runs a thing at Berkeley called the Center for New Media, uh, has built a system for uh, crowdsourced opinion gathering. And so um, what they do there is, uh, it's actually interesting that his stuff is uh, on the Department of State's website. And if you're interested, you can go to the Department of State's website and you can make a comment on, uh, you can make a comment on some question about US foreign policy. And then uh, people rate each other's comments. And uh, you know, the whole idea there is to, to try to form uh, some amount of consensus as well as to sort of to understand what the different uh, main opinions are. Okay, and so it's a very people-oriented project, which is why we're involved with that one. And then one that we're just getting started on, this is the third time you've seen this graph today, which is interesting. Um, this is the graph of the cost of sequencing, uh, uh, the cost of sequencing over time. Uh, this one is a slightly different one maybe, but uh, this is Moore's law. That's the cost of computing. This is the cost of sequencing. And obviously, there's going to be a huge data problem, right? Because it's just getting so cheap to sequence genes. Um, and computation's not keeping up with that. OK, so uh, we're working with a group at UCSF that's looking at, uh, in the cloud, um, moving a bunch of their sequencing pipelines. OK, and um, as you'd imagine, for the reasons we talked about earlier, it's a private cloud, but it's still a cloud. <laughs> okay, yeah, that's one thing we've got to get straight. Uh, so that's another project that we're working on. And, and the ultimate goal here, by the way, is to come up with uh, personalized uh, treatments, uh, both for infectious diseases and then there's a project on uh, personalized cancer treatments. Um, and so this is a really high impact, important problem that we're hoping some of the technology we develop can help. Okay, so th those are the applications that we're using to, to help drive what we do. 
Okay, so now let me get into a little bit more about some of the technology. So uh, I'll talk quickly about algorithms and machines, and then I, I want to go into a little detail on people because that's kind of the newer, newer stuff. So um, we're building this thing called the Berkeley Data Analytics System, BDAS, uh, or if you're in the know, it's actually pronounced badass. And um, it's actually a fairly traditional stack. If you're familiar with sort of a NoSQL data processing stack, um, you know, you've got your operating system stuff down here, computational resource management. Uh, you've got some sort of scalable storage engine. We've built one called SCADS. You've got different ways of, of processing the data. Um, I'll tell you about um, one of the frameworks we've built called uh, Spark. And then uh, machine learning uh, libraries and analytics on top of that. And I guess what's different, um, or some of the things that are different, are a couple things. One is you'll see that when we look at the resources we have, not only do we have the computers, but we also think hard about how do we get data and how do we collect data. Okay? And we also think hard about how do we integrate people uh, as a resource into the system. So I'll talk about mostly about this one here. Um, there's also a bunch of cross-cutting concerns um, that, that we need to fit into the architecture. So a huge one is debugging. As you're building these layers of software systems in these virtualized environments, um, how do you figure out what's going on when something goes wrong? So we have a bunch of work going on there. Um, one of the themes of, of our work is that you want answers that um, are continuously improving. And so that means you need uh, a way to tell how good your current answer is. And you need a way to predict what you need to do in order to get a better answer. So quality control uh, kind of filters through the whole architecture. Um, you know, if I, if I looked at this much more data, I could increase the confidence of my answer by this much, okay? Uh, and then privacy, um, I'm going to defer to Jim's description of what to do about privacy for that, but it's obviously a cross-cutting concern. Okay, so this is a bit of an eye chart, but just to put things into context. So what I'm going to tell you about next is I'm going to tell you a little bit about a system we built uh, called Mesos, which is a resource manager for managing large clusters. I'll tell you a little bit about a system we call, built called Spark which is actually, uh, among other things, does iterative map reduce, which we just heard a nice talk on. So I don't have to say too much about that. And then um, I'll talk about what we're doing with one of the, a fun thing we're doing with the crowd. And maybe more than fun, maybe really interesting. So um, let me talk briefly about algorithms. Um, the basic idea there is um, that you, 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 you want to get an answer on some amount of data. Uh, and in the machine learning world, you know, the idea is that the more data you look at, the, better, the closer you get to the actual real answer. And so if you could get error bars on every answer, that would be a way for you to tell how, how good you're doing. Do I need to run this algorithm longer? Do I need to look at more data? Okay. So a big uh, part of what we're trying to do on the algorithm side is figure out how to get this notion of, of answer quality, and, and in particular error bars, uh, into all of our different machine learning algorithms. And there's been some really interesting work there uh, that the machine learning guys have done in terms of uh, trying to make this, this error management scale. So there were some techniques that have been uh, developed you know, for many years. Uh, there's a technique called the bootstrap, uh, which is a randomized technique for, for figuring out error bars. Problem is it doesn't scale very well. These guys have been coming up with some really interesting ways to figure out how to make those types of error analyses scale over large clusters. Okay. So one part of the research is just to get those error bars. Um, another thing is once you have different algorithms uh, and you understand what their, what, their, what their behavior is in terms of converging to that real answer, then we'd like automatic systems to be able to tell you, oh, well, if this is your budget and this is your quality constraints, you should use this algorithm. Or maybe what you should do is use this algorithm for a while and then switch to this other one. And so Mike Jordan, who's the guy who's doing uh, our machine learning stuff, the way he likes to say it, and I, I don't want to be the one quoted on this, but he, he's a machine learning guy. He wants to make machine learning an engineering discipline. Okay, so the whole idea of trade-offs, you can spend more time, you get a better answer. You can spend more money, maybe less time. Right? Those notions of trade-offs are not traditionally thought of in the machine learning community, and they need to be if you want to handle big data. So that's what we're doing uh, there. Um, there's another problem, which I already mentioned, in terms of when you can get into trouble uh, asking questions on big data. So there's really two ways that data can grow. One is, for an existing set of features, you can get more data. So if you think of data as tables, which as a database guy, I like to think about it that way, um, getting more data means getting more rows. So you can get more rows, 
Okay, and there your answers get better, right? So you can ask more questions more reliably. Okay, at some point, you know, it doesn't support the questions you want to uh, answer you, that you want to ask. But the other way data can grow is by features. So you can learn more and more dimensions about the data you have, and that's where you got to be careful. Um, because that's where if you're looking for correlations, like let's say you're doing some sort of medical study, and you're looking for correlations, um, at some point you'll be able to come up with some correlation uh, and find evidence for it in your data, um, even though it's really more just a fact of, of randomness, that you have so much information that you just find some random results. And so um, what we want to be able to do is figure out for a given uh, environment, a given data environment, based on you know, how much data we have in terms of rows and columns, what are the set of questions that we can answer with, with some confidence? Okay, and so that's part of the work that's going on there too. And so um, you know, how do you tell a rare event from something that's, that, that is so rare that it, it's not really true? Okay? And the other thing that, that's coming out as we're all trying to work together on this project is you know, this notion of uh, getting more data gives you a better answer, uh, which was the way the machine learning guys like to look at things. Um, I'm a database guy. I'm the opposite. The more data you give me, the more confused I get, right? Because things, things all of a sudden start conflicting, right? And if you start looking at less and less reliable data uh, sources, you start getting weirder and weirder answers. Um, and so, you know, how do we reconcile those two views of, of quality? I think that's a big uh, part of what we're going to be doing. Um, on the machine side, the theme there is, you know, data center as a computer. So what you'd like is to be able to program your data center as easily as you can program a single machine, but there's a lot of problems there, right? There's a lot of special purpose systems. It's hard to mix and match um, the different environments you have. Um, it's hard to predict performance, and performance can vary all over the map. It's hard to program, even though there are tools, it's hard to program large clusters, especially at a data center uh, scale. And as we already talked about, it's hard to debug. And so, on the machine side of thing, our current agenda is, is looking at, 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 at these types of problems. So um, I'll just drill down on two of them. Um, the first problem I wanted to talk about is this problem of, of cluster computing frameworks. So there's lots of uh, different tools that people are developing to process you know, large data. Uh, Hadoop we've heard a lot about. Pregel is a graph-oriented database. Dryad, you know, PIG and MPI we've heard about, and so on. Okay, so there are all these frameworks out there. They were all built for certain classes of applications, and they're good at some things and less good at other things. Okay, and so to, to say there's going to be one framework that everyone uses just isn't practical. And so um, what you'd really like to be able to do is have all these frameworks coexist in your cluster so that you can use the framework that's right for your problem, somebody else can use the framework that's right for their problem, and you both get efficient use of the resources and, and, and a fair share of your resources. And so, um, you know, the idea behind this first project that's called Mesos uh, is we want to try to run multiple frameworks. We want to get good utilization out of, the, out of the machines because that's the whole reason you do cloud computing, um, or that's one of the main reasons you do cloud computing. That's the economic benefit of cloud computing. So you want to maximize utilization. Uh, and, you know, there's benefits for sharing data across these frameworks, too, because, as I said, a lot of work goes into collecting and cleaning and making sense of this information. You want to have lots of different applications be able to use it. So Mesos is um, a resource uh, sharing layer um, that sits between these existing frameworks and the, underlying, uh, and the underlying computing infrastructure. And so what it does is it does uh, fine-grained sharing. Um, it, um, and it's got a mechanism for basically abstracting these resources so that it, um, when resources become available, it, it offers them to these frameworks, and the frameworks can, can choose to use them or not. Okay? And uh, there's a recent paper in NSDI on, on this system. So just to, I'm not going to go into the details of Mesos, but I just want to show you w sort of what it does. So this is an experiment um, that shows uh, this is time going along the x-axis. And we had three frameworks running in parallel, uh, MPI, Hadoop, and, and Spark, which is our own uh, computing framework that I'll tell you about next. And the idea is that um, Hadoop and Spark are flexible as, as they can, you know, at different points in their execution, they can use more uh, resources. 
Uh, you know, and, and Hadoop in particular is particularly greedy. It'll use as many machines as you give it. Um, MPI, on the other hand, uh, is, is more static. And so what's happening here is each one of these is supposed to get a third of the resources. And what you see is that, you know, first we start up Spark, then Hadoop, and then MPI. And what you can see is MPI pretty much uh, gets its third of the, of the resources and just keeps them. And what's happening here is Spark is running an iterative job that does a bunch of work, and then it goes away for a while, and then it does a bunch of more uh, computation. And what's happening here is that Hadoop is able to fill in uh, those gaps and, and take advantage of the, resource, the computing resources that uh, the Spark uh, implementation isn't using at a given time. And the way that Mesos does this is by inter interposing uh, a layer, uh, a scheduling layer, uh, under each of those frameworks. And then it has a, uh, a resource management system that figures out when resources become available, again, offers those resources to the frameworks, and tries to preserve uh, certain guarantees about fairness of allocation and so on. And so again, the idea here is that you know, if, if you want to run MPI and you want your third of the data center, you'll get it. If you're doing something more flexible, you'll get at least the third that you were promised. And if other things become available, you get those on an opportunistic uh, uh, basis. So this is what Mesos does. And um, you know, just briefly, um, you know, it's, a bunch, it's a bunch of C++. Um, you know, big problem or, that you have to deal with is, is this master. Make sure that doesn't become a bottleneck. And so uh, there's open source. Uh, Zookeeper is an open source system for, for allowing you to have uh, masters that can fail over. Um, and we run a bunch of uh, different frameworks on it. Uh, and it's currently in use in a bunch of places, uh, obviously in Berkeley and a few places at UCSF, uh, in that genomics application I mentioned. Uh, Twitter's been using it for some things and some other companies as well. So. Um, that's, oh, and it's available open source. If you're interested, it's an Apache incubation project now. OK? So that's Mesos. The other thing I'll mention just briefly is a, a framework that we've built called Spark. And Spark was originally motivated by exactly the, the, the same problem that the Twister system that we heard about earlier today was motivated by, which is MapReduce is just terrible for iterative jobs. And a lot of the computations you want to do, especially when you're doing machine learning, are iterative comp computations. Right? So it's a really bad match. And so um, Spark uh, was originally set to solve that problem. Um, but we came at it in a slightly different way. And what we did is we built an abstraction uh, that we call resilient distributed data sets, which is basically a distributed mem memory abstraction um, that you can program against. And the, if you use an RDD, the system takes care of both uh, partitioning uh, you know, for load balancing and, and stuff like that, as well as fault tolerance. Okay, and so the idea is it's a high-level abstraction. And with that abstraction, you can implement uh, these iterative types of algorithms. I'll show you that in a second. Uh, but you can also uh, do other things like interactive data mining. Um, and the, one of the key insights of this RDD approach is that the way we handle fault tolerance, there's a discussion about fault tolerance when we talked about Twister. Um, what we do is, is a little different than what was discussed there. We have a notion called lineage, which is uh, RDDs um, are transformed in a very controlled way through a, through a somewhat narrow API. And then what you can do if you do that, you can basically, for each piece of an RDD that's stored on a, on a machine, you can record the sequence of steps that it took to generate that RDD. Okay, and that's called the lineage. And so if you want to do fault tolerance with an RDD, all you need to do is keep that lineage somewhere. If a node fails or if you run out of memory or something like that, you could take that lineage, reinstantiate just that portion of the RDD that was lost by replaying uh, the lineage, and move on from there. Okay, and so it's a it's a slightly more um, uh, logical level view towards fault tolerance, and it and it actually builds on techniques that were developed in database systems in terms of uh, you know write ahead logging and things like that. Okay, so um, that's what Spark is. Um, and it's exactly the problem that we heard earlier. If you try to run an iterative job on MapReduce, it's going to communicate through the disk. I mean, that was a perfect way of saying it. What Spark does is it says, OK, I know you're doing iterations. And it just allows you to keep the, the hot set of data in memory. It does processor af affinity to make sure that the next iteration runs at the same machine where the data it needs is. And then again, it's got this fault tolerance thing tied in in case something goes wrong. Okay, and, and um, this, it's based on a language called Scala. 
And so here's a, a serial version of it. And basically, uh, this is a logistic reg regression uh, algorithm. And basically, what you do is instead of using the, the native data structures, you, you use the Spark data structures, which are these resilient data sets. Um, and you, what you get for that is the partitioning, uh, the processor affinity, and, and, and the uh, fault tolerance. Okay, and so uh, you know, if you look at sort of the core of this, this iterative algorithm, it doesn't change at all. Okay, so that's our view of, of uh, how to solve that same problem that you know, Twister was solving and, and uh, the Haloop system that was developed at Washington is solving, as well as some other things uh, like uh, graph-oriented uh, processing. Uh, I mentioned the system Pragle, which is a, a system that Google has. We have one called Bagel, which is the Berkeley version of Pragle, uh, which is uh, uh, you know, a language for doing graph computations. Uh, and just uh, to, to kind of hammer home why this is important, at least from a performance point of view, um, this is uh, an iterative logistic regression. Uh, that's the first iteration, and then we go out to 30 iterations. The blue is how long it takes Hadoop to run, and the red is Spark. And what you see is the first iteration, we have a little bit of overhead. Uh, we'll work on that. But then as you continue to do iterations, uh, Hadoop basically pays the same amount for every iteration. So that just grows linearly, whereas uh, you know, Spark is able to do much better for each iteration because that's what it, you know, it's doing caching and it's doing processor affinity and it's not communicating through the disk. So you know, the first iteration costs you um, a little more than, the, uh, than a Hadoop iteration, but then each one subsequent to that uh, costs you a lot less. So you know, this is a known problem with Hadoop. It's been addressed in several different systems. And you know, ultimately, I assume it'll be addressed in Hadoop itself. Um, but this is just another take on that. OK, so I talked about um, a little bit about what we're doing in terms of algorithms. I talked uh, about what we're doing, uh, again, some of the projects on the machine side. But the rest of the time, I want to just focus on one problem uh, that we're working on on the people side. Because this, in some sense, is, is kind of the, the, the more unique side of what we're doing. So the goal with people is we want to leverage uh, humans, if I can say that politely. Um, and we want to leverage two things, what they do and sort of how smart they are. Okay, and in terms of what they what they do, um, you know, this happens all the time, right? You're, you you all are constantly being uh, leveraged in that way. Every time you go to a website, that website is learning things about you as a as an individual, but also as a certain type of individual, and that information is is being uh, used to to uh, you know improve the uh, website if you're if you're optimistic, or sell you more junk if you're less optimistic. But um, you know, so so it's. You know, since we're all connected, it's very easy to, to, to be able to get access to people's activities. You can use that for a lot of interesting things, OK, and a lot of good things. Um, human intelligence, you need to be uh, probably a little more explicit about getting it, OK? And so what are we going to do? You know, so crowdsourcing is, is kind of the buzzword there. And you know, there's a, a few things you can, you can ask people to do for you. We'll talk about those in a second. The challenge is, there's a bunch of challenges, but you know, kind of the fundamental challenge is that um, people are really unpredictable. <laughs> um, and if you're trying to integrate people into a system uh, that's made up of relatively predictable components, uh, you've got kind of an impedance mismatch there, and then you've got to deal with it. So you know, how do you incentivize people to do work? How do you incentivize people to do work quickly? Uh, how do you incentivize people to give you good answers? OK, all these sorts of things. Are, and how do you coordinate people to actually get stuff done? So, um, you know, we have this grand vision of integrating algorithms, machines, and people. Crowd, this thing I'm going to talk about next is called CrowdDB. It's, it's kind of a little baby step. And, and I think it'll, it's, it kind of shows you what some of the interesting issues are. So let me motivate Crowd, CrowdDB by uh, giving some examples of, of some database problems. So here's a database. It's a database about companies and where they are and what they're worth. Uh, I didn't update it this morning. This was last night. Um, so you know, we've got Google, we've got international business machines, we've got Microsoft. Now you show up and you say, oh, OK, I want to know about the market capitalization of this company named IBM. OK, so that's OK. Your company spent you know, $6 million on a big database machine. They loaded these three records into it. And then they let you run your query. And the thing chews for a while, and it comes back with an answer. And it says, yeah, no, we don't know anything about IBM. OK. Why is that? Well, because a database system, SQL system, doesn't know that IBM and international business machines are the same. It's an entity re resolution problem. Right? You knew that. 
That's, that's what we're going to get to. But the database didn't know that. Um, OK, here's another problem. Um, you have the same database. You ask for a company uh, called Apple. What's their market cap? Um, I didn't put that on here. I didn't want anyone to feel bad. But um, <laughs> you know, if you, ask your, if you ask your database that, it says, well, no such, there's no such company as Apple. Because databases are built on this thing called the closed world assumption, which says, if it's not in the database, it's not true, or it doesn't exist. Okay, that's the foundation of database semantics. Okay? Now, you know there's a company called Apple, and you could probably go out and find its market cap. Okay? So that's another thing that databases are bad at. Um, this is another one where you have a bunch of pictures, and you say, OK, I want to find, I'm about to give a talk, and I need a picture that demonstrates business success, because I'm doing like a motivational talk to a bunch of business people. So find me the best picture that represents business success. Um, database system's not really good at that either, because it's kind of, a, what does best mean in that case? Right? So you can write the query, order by relevance, but unless somebody's actually pre-computed all those relevances, it's, a database system can't answer it. OK, now what are some easy queries? Well, OK, here's our example again with uh, our three rows. We asked for the market cap of IBM, but now we ask people. And sure, OK, they, they're going to be able to give you that answer. OK, um, here's another, if I can get this to work, here's another question. So I've got these three software companies. Which is the cool one? Right? Well, people can tell you that. I'm not telling you. So, OK. So, but sure, you can answer that one too. Now, you know, that's also a subjective one, and that's going to change over time as well. Okay? So the, the bottom line is that there are things um, that are really impossible for, for a literal syntactic system like a database system to answer, and are really easy for people to answer, and vice versa. So what are we going to do? Well, um, there are systems out there uh, more and more every day um, that are our, their, their basic business model is to aggregate people and uh, allow those people to do work and, and get paid or some other, you know, get points or something for doing that work. And so um, there's a class of these systems called microtasking systems where the idea is you give jobs that are fairly short, you know, jobs that can be done in, in seconds or minutes. And uh, the kind of the market leader in this right now is a system that Amazon uh, supports called Amazon Mechanical Turk. And what you do is you place these jobs that they call hits, or human intelligent tasks. Um, you put a price on them, and you say, OK, I've, you know, I need these 100 images labeled. I'm willing to pay 5 cents an image. You send it out there, and there's a bunch of people out there, workers, or they're called, in this case, Turkers. Uh, and they pick up those jobs and do them. And then you look at the work. And if you decide uh, the work was adequate, you, you pay them. And you know, AMT has a payment mechanism built into it. OK? So what's really interesting about this, um, from, from our perspective, is that Mechanical Turk and systems like it are API-based. So you can program against them. Okay? So you can really think about this collection of people, in this case anonymous or largely anonymous. In other cases, maybe not. It depends on the marketplace. But you can think of this, this collection of people uh, as a resource that you can program. Okay? That's kind of the interesting thing here. So if you say, OK, well, if I want to solve these hard database problems, these ones that my $6 million database machine can't solve, OK, but I could solve by paying somebody five cents to do it, um, then what you can do is you say, OK, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this, this crowd API under my database processor. OK, so I'm going to ask my database system SQL queries. There'll be some that it can answer great in which case it'll just answer them. There'll be other ca cases where it doesn't know the answer, in which case it can just make a call to the crowd to get the answer, right? If you're familiar with uh, who wants to be a millionaire, right? It's, it's your lifeline, right? You can ask the audience what's the answer. It's, it's, it's exactly what that is, except for a database system. So you know, now you have to think about, OK, so how to do it is actually pretty easy, because there's this API. Um, the question is when to do it. And so you've got to think hard about when to use the crowd. Um, and so the things that we've decided to use a crowd for are you know, to find missing data, like the Apple case that I showed you, to make subjective comparisons, like the what's the coolest software company uh, case I showed you. Um, people are great at recognizing patterns. Uh, so that's another use case that, that, that you'd like to use. And what you don't want to do is stuff that the computer's already good at doing. And so there's been a lot of kind of fun work that people have been doing in crowdsourcing saying, hey, could I get a crowd to you know, do a quick sort on this list of 20 numbers? And the answer is you can. But boy, it's slow and expensive and error prone. It's not a good use of the crowd. 
Um, but there are a bunch of things that the crowd's really good at. And so a big part of this research agenda, not just for CrowdDB, but in general, is to figure out you know, when to use the crowd, when to use the machines. And, and we talked earlier about code design. Um, Jim mentioned the idea of co-designing algorithms and, and hardware. We want to co-design you know, systems that use algorithms and people, okay? and, and, and sort of figure out what the right way to build those are. So um, just quickly, um, we made some simple changes to SQL. So you could say that a table has a column that you, you can ask the crowd about. So this is saying companies, and I, don't know where, you know, I might not know where their address is. Uh, you could say that you can, you can crowdsource individual rows. So here's a table about departments uh, at a university, and I can ask the crowd to fill in the entire row. Um, and then in the query language, you can do a fuzzy equality, and that's something you might ask people for. So you know, is, is IBM the same as Big Blue? Uh, and then you could do these uh, crowd rankings of things. So you know, for what's the best picture, for example? All right, so just very simple changes to the syntax. Um, now, once you've done this, you've got a SQL query. You've got resources underneath uh, your query executor, which are going to be some combination of the query engine and, and the crowd. And so then you can start doing query optimization. And so um, this is basically, it's a bit of an eye chart. I apologize. But basically, you take the SQL, you put it into a logical plan that just says, I'm going to take professors and departments. I'm going to join them. And I'm going to do a filter. I'm going to select some of those rows. Right? So this is a uh, a query that's looking for my PhD advisor, uh, my carry. And um, so what you do is you get that logical plan, then you optimize it, right? Because you don't want to take all the professors in the world and all the departments in the world and join them and then pick out my carry. What you want to do is find my carry and then figure out what department he's in. Okay, that's what a relational query optimizer will do. It's called pushing, sorry, it's called pushing selects. Um, now the interesting thing is when we do the compilation, um, we compile to uh, these specialized operators that know how to use the crowd. And when you want to ask the crowd a question, you can't just ask them the question. You have to give them a user interface. So one of the interesting things about CrowdDB is it uses the schema um, to generate a form for people to fill in. So just like an easy-to-use database system like Microsoft Access uh, or other, other types of uh, like Oracle Forms and things like that, um, you can use the schema information to generate the user interface. So you can actually do that automatically. So what comes out of this thing is an efficient plan that is able to call the crowd to fill in the missing pieces. That's, that, in a nutshell, that's what we're doing. And the fun part is we get to use all our kind of relational database query optimization stuff to make it work. Um, so a big part of what you need to do is generate the user interface. Now, um, I'll, talk, uh, I'll talk briefly um, about answer quality. It's actually a huge problem. So one of the things we learned, we, we were doing this one question where we were um, saying, uh, we were trying to do entity resolution. And we said, OK, here's a term. Which of, the following, which of the following terms matches that term? And we would send that out. And we were getting just terrible, terrible quality. We were getting you know, like, you know, under 50% accuracy in the answers we were getting from the crowd. Oh, this thing is on autopilot, I'm sorry. Um, so, why, so what was going on? Well, what happened was we realized that um, people were afraid. Sometimes there wasn't a good answer in the list that we gave them. And people, realized, we, people were afraid that if they didn't click something, they wouldn't get paid. So we added a none of the above button. Our quality went up to you know, something like 80 or 90%, which is much better, and it, and it was fine. So one of the interesting lessons there was you can't just generate any user interface. You have to, the, the way you ask the question impacts how good an answer you're going to get. And that's another research issue in, the, in this place. Um, Another thing I'll just mention briefly is um, you know, I, I showed you that, that case when we asked for the, the market cap of Apple, and, and the system came back and said, there isn't any company called Apple. That was because of the closed world assumption. When you go out to the crowd, you've all of a sudden broken the closed world assumption. The world is now open. That's, that's great in terms of getting answers. It's really bad in terms of efficiency. right? Because in a database system, you know you're going to iterate over a bounded amount of information. Right? Because that's all that is there. In the crowd, you can get all sorts of stuff, including things that don't exist. So um, you have to think differently about optimization. And I'll just, you know, if you run the plan this way, you can get infinite results. If you run it this way, you can actually bound the results. And so there's a bunch of different cases where you, where you need to do that type of analysis. But you can do that kind of analysis because it's all based on relational algebra, which has a very well understood semantics. And you can actually 
tell when a query is bound and when it isn't. Okay, and so you just have to be careful about what you run. That's a little bit of a detail. All right, so um, you know, just briefly, how does it work? Well, um, you know, another type of interface you can generate is this. Is this uh, you know, for, for comparisons, you say you know, are these two things the same? Uh, if you wanted to find out which is the best picture, you could just show them pairwise and ask people to pick. You could show them in groups and ask people to order them. There's a bunch of different ways, so there's, there's questions there about how to do it efficiently. Um, but we were able to uh, ask the crowd, you know, here's a bunch of pictures of the Golden Gate, Gate Bridge, which is the best one, and this is sorted in the answer that Mechanical Turk gave it back to us. And it's hard to read this, but it's, it matches pretty well what our expert panel said. And our expert panels are people in our lab who, uh, students who happen to have a window that looks out on the Golden Gate Bridge, so they are experts. And sure enough, it, it found the good ones. So that's good. All right, so now the question is, um, um, how far can we push this metaphor? I've got a programmable resource, which is a, the crowd. Okay, Can I build a crowd optimizer? This is what we said. You know, I know how to optimize queries when they're running on um, computers. Can I do similar things? Can I learn the performance characteristics of the crowd and then automatically compile my queries in a way that's going to be efficient. So this is a picture of Tim Kraska, who's a guy in our lab who was doing this work. And he has a query that he wants to ask. They want to find out stuff about restaurants in some city. And you know, he's going to ask this query of the crowd. But the way he really wants to think about it is it's really not a crowd. It's, 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 it's a resource. It's a computing resource. Okay? And if this is true, if we can make this metaphor work, then um, you know, we've got a lot of technology we can just plug in and be able to build efficient crowd-oriented query systems. OK, well, here's some studies we did. Uh, this is for a simple query like the one I showed you. And this says, OK, the blue line, it, this is time. And this is uh, what the uh, percentage of, of completion. OK, and this blue line is what happens if you pay people one cent for an answer. And these other lines are what happens if you pay people between two and four cents for an answer. And what this experiment showed is that for this particular task, one cent is too little. It doesn't matter if you pay two, three, or four cents. Okay? And so the idea is if you could benchmark, if you could do micro benchmarks on the crowd like this, you could eventually build up this cost model. So for a given query, you could figure out how much should I pay, how many jobs should I put out there, and so on. So very positive. So Tim was very happy when we saw this result. But then we started seeing some other results. So one thing we learned, sorry. So one thing we learned is that it turns out that most, peop, that most of your jobs are done by very few people. So this is. Um, from, <clears throat> this is the worker who did the most jobs. These are the workers who did the least jobs. Most of our jobs that we sent out for this particular case were done by a couple people. Okay? And furthermore, we said, OK, well, people who do more jobs probably get better at it. Okay, that's what this red line is, is the error rate. And unfortunately, we didn't see any correlation there either. Okay? So we thought we had this resource of you know, tens of thousands of people, but in fact, we had like five. Okay, and furthermore, people who did a lot of our jobs weren't any better at doing them than people who did one or two of our jobs. Okay, so things were not working out the way we thought they were. So, you know, Tim had this dream. Well, it wasn't just Tim, it was all of us. We had this dream. We were going to use this API to the crowd and, and, and be able to have a, a programmable resource. But what happened is we started sending out queries and this strange thing started happening. We started hearing this weird noise coming from our machine. And all of a sudden, somebody said, hey, I think. I think these guys are, I don't think this is a real job. I think these people are experimenting on us. And somebody else said, uh, yeah, you know, I think these guys are trying to install weird spyware on our machines and we shouldn't work for them. And someone else said, no, no, you know what? I like these guys. They're, they're, their jobs are, are great. And it's like all of a sudden, you know, imagine submitting a program to your computer and it says, uh, I, don't, I don't like you. I don't want to do your job. Or, you know, you weren't nice to me yesterday. I'm not going to do your job. That's what programming the crowd, the crowd is like. And you know, this isn't fanciful. What happens is there are these um, forums, online forums, where people who work for Mechanical Turk, in particular, uh, talk about jobs that they've done. You know, was it a good job? Was the pay fair? Did they get paid? Um, and they talk about, you know, um, you know, should you do work for this person or not? And so what happens is you actually develop a, a, a relationship with your with your processors. Uh, which is something that you know, those of us who thought about you know, scheduling in, in data centers, it wasn't something we worry about a lot of things, but that wasn't one of them, right? So um, you know, this is just an indication that this world is, is just very different. All right, 
Um, I, I won't go over this, but you know, if you if you try to think about you know machines versus people, there's a lot of things that, that are the same. Well, they're not really. <laughs> there's very few things that are the same. But you know, you pay a certain amount. Uh, if you use the cl the crowd, you can pay as you go. If you use the cloud, you can pay as you go. You know, there's some nice things like that. But um, you know, there's some real issues where you know, yes, you have to worry about reliability in the cloud because um, devices can be faulty, but they they're not really going to be malicious. Right? Whereas in the crowd, they really can be malicious. People do try to spam you. In fact, you'd think that the more you paid for a job, the better your answer would get. But it's interesting. As you cross a threshold and pay more for certain types of work, uh, spammers get interested. And they start running bots to do your jobs. And so you know, your quality goes up for a while, and then it goes way down. Okay, so you just have to learn these things. And you know, there are just a lot of issues. Uh, you know, yes, privacy is an issue for, for the cloud. but for the crowd, you've got even more privacy because people are looking at the data. So if you ask somebody, hey, could you please look at this mammogram and tell me if there's something in there? Um, you know, that's pretty personal information. You can't just put that out on, to the crowd, right? So, you, you, so there's a huge privacy problem. Plus, you have to worry about these people aren't processors. They're people. And so you've got to worry about you know, quality of life issues, work issues, you know, are they being paid, benefits, taxes, all that stuff. So, um, it's nice to think about this resource as a programmable resource, but there are a lot of issues. And, th and that's kind of uh, a part of the fun. So just briefly, um, you know, is crowdsourcing the future of databases? Maybe. Um, it, are databases the future of crowdsourcing? So uh, a lot of people are trying to figure out how to program this crowd resource. There's a lot of hard problems. Um, databases can help those problems because databases are built to uh, be able to tolerate lots of different environments. And so we think um, you know, declarative queries like uh, CrowdDB queries are, are an interesting way to program uh, the crowd. Uh, interestingly, when our, when our first paper got accepted to a database conference, uh, we saw this tweet go by. Uh, it says, Sigmod 2000 accepted uh, a paper on crowdsourcing. Weird. <laughs> so it's not clear that the crowdsourcing people are ready for this. Uh, but you know, they'll get there. So uh, just to summarize, um, we're interested in solving the big data problem. And we believe that in order to solve that problem, you've got to think holistically about what algorithms you're running, how are you leveraging machine resources, and how do you include people, uh, not just sort of at the end of the process, but at the beginning of the process in terms of data collection, and throughout the process in terms of uh, helping you uh, do the analytics. And so you know, our vision is, we're going to build systems that, that combine all these resources. And again, um, you know, we think it's sort of the computing challenge of the desk decade. And uh, hope you found it interesting. So. Let's thank the speaker. <laughs> great, great talk, Mike. Thanks. Only, only a database guy would think of writing optimizations across people. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we have time for one, maybe two questions. So uh, I think I see one up in the back. Oh, no. Any questions? Hi, Paul Watson, Newcastle. Uh, I enjoyed your talk very much. Uh, one of the things I was interested in, you, you were looking at using people to help you out to solve particular problems that you thought that they were good at. I wondered whether you'd thought about using people to improve the algorithms with some sort of prize structure. So when you found an algorithm was, was really important and crucial to you, then you could put out a prize and get people to produce better algorithms you could then use? So, OK, so, um, so that's one way to have people help with algorithms. And it's a really powerful one. I mean, the Netflix prize and all that. So we certainly thought about things like that. Um, the, the other thing, which I'm glad you bring, bring up, is that you know, the question is, just because you start with a problem that, that you need people for, once enough people answer that question, you can come up with an algorithm that learns from what the people do. And so we think that, 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 that um, the line between what you need people for and what, you need compu what computers can do is going to shift over time. And so I think this question of, you know, let's not just use people as processors. That's kind of a dumb use of people. But let's, let's figure out how to get people involved in improving the algorithms, either by explicitly coming up with a new algorithm or by just doing the right thing so that an algorithm can learn. I think that's where the, where the real powerful uh, symbiosis is going to be. Great. Um, any other questions? Uh, 
I agree. It was a great talk. One of the things that I'm, I'm wondering about when I think about the crowdsourcing, I think about the web is basically human-generated material, at least a lot of it. And I looked at a lot of the queries that you generated, uh, except for the things like pattern matching. I mean, I could submit that to a web index and get an answer. And if I think about the, the results there, the web is as a distillation of the crowd in some sense already. Uh, have you ever thought about comparing what you would do against your, your real crowd versus this, this refined or filtered crowd? Right, so sort of a, a, an AMP Turing test or something yeah. like that. Yeah, I mean, um, so it's interesting because a, a lot of the DB hard questions that I showed are, are sort of search engine easy, sort of. But actually, search engines, uh, until pretty recently, when you ask them a question like, what's the market capitalization of IBM? They would bring up web pages about, about IBM. And if you were lucky, somewhere on one of those web pages was something that said the market cap. Search engines have gotten smarter over time so that for certain types of queries, they actually go in and, and do that extra bit of, uh, uh, of analysis to actually pull out the data that you're looking for. But it's still pretty limited. Um, and so I think there's a lot of room for improvement there too. And, and I think, um, again, that's another case where there's, there's people you know, right now looking at queries and figuring out what they mean and then saying, hey, we see a lot of these, so let's, let's add this extra little bit. But if you could automate that, some, that somehow, uh, it would be a much more powerful, uh, you know, powerful environment. Okay, uh, I'm afraid we're out of time, so let's thank Mike again. All right, thank you.